Um, he is very well known. Um, I hear him quite a lot um, as I am an addict of KERA, um, and, and proudly so. <laughs> and um, so you hear him on NPR quite a bit. He is um, graduated from Harvard University with his PhD. His teaching specialties are in social ethics, um, comparative religious ethics, and religion and political thought. Um, he is the author of Reinhold Niebuhr and Christian Realism, as well as Christian Ethics, an Essential Guide. He is currently the president of the Society, or excuse me, in 2000 was the, pres the president of the Society of Christian Ethics and is currently the editor at large for the Christian Century, if you are familiar with that publication. We are so very glad that he is here tonight um, with us, and so I invite you uh, to welcome him with a CUMC warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alexandra, and, and thanks to all of you for coming out. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here uh, and to share this kind of discussion with an audience in a, in a congregation. I occasionally, in my more cynical moods, suggest that, that things are a little inverted. I, I did this at a uh, gathering at Perkins uh, earlier in the week. I, I suggested that these days, a lot of people are getting their religion from HBO and their entertainment from church. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's nice to see a congregation that uh, uh, is, is really trying to reverse that, uh, that trend. And it's a, a real honor to, to be here and to speak to you uh, about this question of the relationship between religion and science that has become so much of a public controversy in our schools, in our political life. And we could talk some uh, uh, at the end of the time about the idea of evolution and the particular questions that creationism and intelligent design and creation science pose for science education in our schools, but I think that to understand the controversy that we have about religion and science today, you have to push much further back in history and look at an earlier uh, controversy. The relations between religion and science are really much older than this controversy or evolution. You know, we, we just had the uh, anniversary of Darwin's Origin of Species, uh, you know, that's a fairly recent thing in the world of science and, and theology. And what I want to suggest to you this evening is that the particular controversy that we are now having about religion and science that circles around the topic of evolution is a problem that was set up for us by the way we solved an earlier controversy between religion and science. So keep that thought in mind, and I think you'll see how the history unfolds as we uh, talk together this evening. As I say, the relations between religion and science are, are really very old. You can already see Augustine, St. Augustine, in the fourth century, thinking about the question, uh, fourth and fifth centuries, thinking about the question of how the biblical story of creation related to the science of his own time. So from early Christianity onward, people have tried to, to bring religion and science together, and they've had various problems along the way that they had to solve in order to do that. Before there was a controversy about evolution, there was a controversy about the solar system. Does the Earth stand at the center of things, or does the Earth rotate around the sun, and the sun is at the center of the solar system? Now, there aren't many people today who would think that that's a religious question, or that the answer to that question has much to do with faith, but in its time, the, the heliocentric theory in astronomy, that is the theory that the sun is at the center 
of the solar system and the planets revolve around the sun. The heliocentric theory, as opposed to the geocentric theory that said the Earth is in the center, the heliocentric theory was as controversial as Darwin's theory of evolution is in biology. So what I want to do today is talk about how that conflict took shape, why there was a conflict between religion and science over the heliocentric theory, and how that conflict was resolved. Because how that conflict got resolved set us up for the controversy that we've had about religion and evolution. If Newton hadn't solved the problem of faith and science uh, in terms of how the planets move in his particular way, Darwin's discoveries wouldn't have posed the religious problems that they have posed for some people over the last hundred years. But that's getting ahead of the story. I want to go back to the beginning. What was the conflict between religion and science that arose with the emergence of the heliocentric theory and why did that happen just when it did? There had been discussions of religion and science, as I say, going way back to Augustine. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages tries to integrate the scientific knowledge of his time with his theology. But in one sense, there couldn't be a conflict between religion and science until modern science emerged as a separate discipline with its own ways of knowing. So I want to talk for a minute about how theology develops a way of knowing and then how science develops an alternative way of knowing that emerged in some conflict with it. Theological investigations from the earliest days of the church, as soon as the church had theologians, which was almost as soon as there was a church, theological investigations rested on authority. The authority of the Bible, the authority of ancient authors, the reputation of the author. So you could, you could not have a conflict between science and religion until religion and science emerge as different ways of investigating the world and different ways of knowing. The idea of authority as the basis for knowledge is that the way you know the world is to get the best opinions and try and bring them all together. You, you know the world in that theological way, of knowing pretty much the way you probably read the evening newspaper or watch television, uh, you know, you hear all sorts of different opinions, and you try to figure out on the basis of whose opinion is most reliable and how you can bring the most evidence together uh, what's actually going on. So the idea of, of uh, authority in theology was you take the Bible, you take the, the ancient philosophers, you take the contemporary philosophers, you take uh, the theologians in the history of, of the church, you take the great writers and thinkers of the Christian tradition, you see what they uh, had to say about the issue, and you try to come up with uh, the appropriate conclusion. St. Thomas Aquinas, in the Middle Ages, developed a dialectical method, of what we call the scholastic method of argument. And if, if you've ever had courses in philosophy or theology, you may have been forced to read Thomas Aquinas. And so you know how those arguments go. All the authorities on one side of the question stacked up, all the authorities on the other side of the question stacked up, and then Thomas Aquinas comes in and resolves the question by uh, interpreting the finer points of the issue and deciding which of the authorities 
he's going to go with. So theological investigation then and now was a matter of taking uh, the opinions of, of recognized authorities and trying to harmonize them, trying to bring them together into a single way of knowing. Get good authorities and harmonize them. Go back and forth between the authorities until you think you get to the right opinion. Those, <clears throat> those early theological investigations also rested heavily on what we might call metaphysics or ontology. Now, I could do a long lecture on what is metaphysics or what is ontology. <laughs> the, the idea of what is really real and how we know that. Because interestingly enough, from very early on, from the time of Plato and the early Greek philosophers, people in Western thought believe that sense knowledge is the worst way <laughs> to figure out what's really going on. What you have to do is get your ideas straight and use your ideas to help you identify what's going on in the world of sense experience. It's a very foreign concept for us in the modern world, but you, you, you see how you get, you, you get your metaphysics straight, you get your ontology straight, you get your ideas straight, and then you go looking for evidence. That's a system that goes all the way back to Plato. And as I say, it means that experience is the least reliable way of knowing what's going on. So <clears throat> imagine at the beginning of the modern world, we've had centuries of that kind of theological investigation, well-developed, finely tuned methods of comparing authorities and coming to the right conclusion. And then modern science begins to investigate the world by relying on carefully recorded observations as the primary source of knowledge. This is revolutionary because as I say, everybody going back to Plato has said, looking at what's going on around you is the worst way <laughs> to figure out how the world is really put together. But the scientists begin developing knowledge uh, by experimental methods. Francis Bacon, who lived from 1561 to 1626, was one of the pioneers of this. Bacon uh, experimented with all sorts of things, including uh, preserving food by freezing it. One of the things that Bacon did was uh, get himself a chicken when he, uh, you, you, if you've been following the news, you know England has had some rare snowstorms just recently. Well, apparently in the early 1600s, they had some tough winters as well. And during one of those, Bacon got himself a chicken and packed it in snow to see if this would uh, be a way of preserving it. Now you can see that already here, the experimental method is beginning to emerge. We get prescribed ways of making careful observations and the insistence that only what we can observe and measure and write down counts. Or to be a little more precise, only what we can observe and then te uh, and, and predict by developing mathematical models about it counts as knowledge. What you can observe and model determines what you can talk about scientifically. For modern science, that meant setting aside metaphysical and ontological questions. You don't solve the question of how to preserve chicken <laughs> by uh, a, you know, a, an ontological analysis of chicken and ice. You have to put the chicken on ice and see what happens. Now, actually, what happened for Bacon shows the uh, 
limits of the experimental method because we, we know that you can preserve chicken by freezing it, but we also know that when you inadequately freeze chicken, uh, you can have real problems when you thaw it out and cook it, which Bacon did and died as a result of the food poisoning that, uh, uh, that uh, followed. Early science was a risky business. Uh, but you can see uh, also how out of those crude experiments we get the beginnings of modern science. At the beginning of the modern period then, we scientists are beginning to say, what I can know is what I can observe and write down, measure, and turn into a model that I can use to repeat those experiments again. Provided, of course, I don't die of my spoiled chicken uh, as a result of the first attempt. We get a distinction here, then, between the what and the why. For all those theological investigations, what people wanted to know was not only what's happening in the world, but what does it mean? Why is it important? What does it imply for my life? And science was about separating the what questions from the why questions. The why questions are not part of science for these early modern scientists. So the beginnings of scientific explanation from say the mid 1500s to the early 1600s begins to develop a new way of knowing that allows for a conflict between religion and science for really the first time because you can't you you can have scientific ideas and religious ideas and scientific authorities and religious authorities and try and bring them together but you can't really have a conflict between religion and science until you've got these two well developed but different ways of knowing the world with the scientific method limiting itself to what it can observe and model mathematically and suggesting that other kinds of knowledge don't really count as knowledge at all. The problems for faith arise when the scientists turn these powers of observation and their skills at developing experimental models to the problem of understanding the motions of the sun and the stars and the planets. That's where this first conflict between religion and science came about. We can see it with Galileo, the Italian scientist, inventor of the telescope, right? Another thing that helps modern science get going is you've got new instruments that enable you to observe things that you couldn't observe before. So Galileo, who lives from 1564 to 1642, makes him almost a contemporary of Bacon, uh, living in roughly the same period of time, Galileo turns his telescope on familiar objects in the heavens and discovers the moons of Jupiter. Oops. Remember, everything is supposed to go around the Earth, which is the center of the universe. So the planets go around the Earth and the sun goes around the Earth and there's not supposed to be anything going around the planets. But there they are, the moons of Jupiter. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to explain how the planets move on, when we compare the old model of the perfect sphere that revolves around the Earth with the observations that we get when we look at these uh, planets with the telescope. Nicholas Copernicus, who lived almost a century earlier, had proposed a different model 
for understanding the universe. He proposed a heliocentric, sun-centered theory for understanding the solar system as a better way of understanding the motions of the planets. This was very controversial in its time, but now Galileo began to use the telescope to get experimental evidence that backed up this picture of a, a world in which the sun was at the center of the solar system and the planets, including the Earth, revolve around the sun and there's other things revolving around the planets and who knows what we'll see when the telescopes get better. So science, by the mid-1600s, is developing its own highly distinctive, specialized method of inquiry. Forget about metaphysics, forget about authority, develop a theory that can then be tested by observation. Sometimes the theory precedes the observations, as with the heliocentric theory. Copernicus came up with the theory before we had the evidence from the telescope. Sometimes the observations precede the theory. That's what happened with the theory of evolution. Darwin started finding all uh, these relationships between species and developed his theory of evolution to explain that. But whether it's the theory that comes first and the observations follow or the observations come first and we build the theory afterwards, that's quite a different way of explaining the world from the theologians going back and forth among the authorities until they come up with a consensus on how the world is organized. And the theologians' uh, way of knowing, of course, includes a lot of moral and metaphysical information that the scientists are in the process of ruling out. We tend to think that people who rejected this early science, thought the world was flat. Uh, you know, in other words, they, they just didn't understand the world around them. They didn't. They had a pretty sophisticated view of the world based on the thinking that had gone before. What they thought was that the heavenly objects moved in perfect circles around a spherical Earth, right? A very orderly universe. Uh, a perfectly spherical Earth in the middle of it with heavenly objects that are themselves perfect spheres moving in perfect circles around that Earth. And they did it, they believed that partly by, because they didn't have the kind of observations that Galileo and Copernicus made, but they also believed it because they thought it made moral and metaphysical sense. The world is God's creation. So it makes sense that while our sinful part of it is a, you know, a little messed up from time to time and quite disorderly, the big picture is perfect. And what's more perfect than a circle and a sphere? So it made moral and metaphysical sense. The problem, of course, was that you couldn't match the observation with the metaphysics very easily. Experiment and observation show us that the Earth moves around the sun, not the other way. And it shows us, as you get better and better observations and better and better math to explain the observations, that the paths themselves are not circular but elliptical. And incidentally, the ellipse was as much a problem as what was in the center of it. It was no longer this perfect circle that was supposed to be there. So we get a conflict between religion and science because religion and science have two different ways of knowing. One builds on observation and includes nothing within its knowledge that can't be demonstrated by observation or built into a theoretical model. And the other tries to integrate 
moral and metaphysical and observational knowledge into a comprehensive picture of the world. The churches, and I can say churches because notice that the Protestant Reformation was happening while all this was going on. One reason why it didn't cause, you know, why it didn't get more attention was Europeans were pretty busy killing each other over religious questions uh, even before they had to worry about uh, whether the earth moved around the sun. So the churches had two rather different ways of responding to this conflict. The Catholic Church tried to maintain this argument from authority, this way of arguing that had, had preceded modern science. The Bible says that the sun moves around the earth, or at least it implies it. There's a, the famous story in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament about how the sun stands still during a battle. Well, the, the obvious question from the churchman was, how could the sun stand still if, in fact, it, it's always still in the first place and the earth is moving around the sun? No, this is obviously wrong. If you read your Bible, you'll know that the earth moves around, the sun moves around the earth and the earth stands still in the middle. But the church added by the way, what good does that kind of materialistic approach to knowledge do you in the first place? It can't be integrated with what we know about the purposes of human life and God's purposes in creation. There's a split in this scientific knowledge between our moral knowledge and our scientific knowledge. So, the Catholic Church initially responded to these new discoveries with the idea that we can still make all these different sources of knowledge coherent with one another. But it was increasingly difficult to do it. And you finally had to reject something, and the Catholic Church decided to reject the empirical knowledge. We're going to discard the observations for theological reasons, and the Church prosecuted Galileo, who was forced to recant his theory that the, uh, and it, well, it wasn't just his theory, but, but his version of the theory that the earth moves around the sun. There's a famous story, probably apocryphal, but it, it uh, uh, kind of expresses the attitude at the time, and that is that, that Galileo, having been uh, uh, tried by the church and convicted and told that he had to uh, give up his scientific theories, uh, did as he was asked, and knelt and, uh, uh, in Latin, uh, you know, renounced his theories for everyone to hear, but was heard to mutter as he stood up in Italian, nevertheless, it moves. <laughs> this may or may not be true, but it, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good story, uh, you know, <laughs> People who were convinced by observation were not going to be talked out of what they could see by theology. And over the long run, of course, the Catholic Church lost its battle against Galileo, and it's been very careful in the last couple of centuries to avoid repeating it. So you don't hear a lot about creationism in Catholic churches for example. Now, I'm sympathetic to Galileo and his battle for intellectual freedom, but, but I also feel something, some sympathy for that Catholic model that says we ought to be able to bring everything we know together and make it all fit. Come back to that uh, in a minute. Protestants did something very different. You might expect the early Protestants to be biblical literalists, but as we'll see, biblical literalism comes a lot later in the story. Bibli uh, 
one of your older members introduce himself to me before, the, uh, uh, before we began. And I, I have to say, biblical literalism is not much older than some of you are. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, uh, in a minute. The early Protestants did something very different from what the Catholics did. You, you might expect them to, to be biblical literalists, but instead what they opted for was a kind of functional independence of scientific knowledge. One of the proofreaders for Copernicus's book that argued for this heliocentric theory of the solar system was Andreas Oseander, who was a Lutheran theologian of the first uh, generation. And he basically said, look, this is not a search for truth. We don't have to argue about who's right, whether it's the Bible or Copernicus. This is a search for better predictions. And you want to use Copernicus's calculations because they work. They tell you what the motions of the stars are going to be like in the future. They tell you where you will find stars and, and planets in the future better than the old geocentric theory did. So don't worry about how to square them with the teachings of the church. Use them for what they're good for. They enable you to do better navigation. They give you more accurate calendars. They enable you to predict eclipses and things of that nature. So the Catholic Church wanted to try and keep all of this knowledge together, and sometimes they were willing to do that by eliminating the observations. The Protestants tended to settle for a kind of functional independence, said, use the science for what it's good for, and uh, uh, leave the theolog theology to the theologians. That's kind of unstable combination, and eventually, of course, people tried to, to work out a way of, of uniting science and, and theology again. And for that, we turn to the figure of Isaac Newton. Newton was born in 1642, which it, coincidentally is the year that Galileo died. So you can kind of see how the progress goes here from the middle of the 1400s through heavily experimental work in the early 1600s. And then Newton is going to come along toward the end of the 1600s. He lives to 1727. And he's going to try to put it all together with mathematics. The Catholic Church failed to put it all together with metaphysics, but maybe mathematics will work. So we moved from a world which required that God sort of get the sun up every morning and drag it across the heavens and let it uh, set on the other side to a world in which the sun would move by itself, and finally to a world in which we began to understand gravity and motion in ways that made those patterns of motion in the heavens completely self-sustaining. That's how Newton integrated observation and metaphysics, by talking about an orderly universe in which the ways that things move were completely predictable by mathematical models. Newton uh, himself was profoundly religious, even from our point of view, weirdly religious. Uh, when you do the uh, eschatology, uh, I don't know whether you should ask Fred Schmidt about Newton's eschatology, but he had one and it was weird. In any case, <laughs> Newton thought that God took a direct hand in keeping this machinery going and making sure that the universe was like a finely tuned machine where everything worked the way it was supposed to. 
but he set up the ideal of mathematical explanation that gradually made God's direct intervention in the world unnecessary. So the idea that Newton gave us is find laws, that is to say mathematical formulas, that describe order with increasing accuracy so that we can see how the machine moves by itself. Call this Newtonian physics as a shorthand name for the kind of physics we had down to the beginning of the 20th century. And by and large, religion adopted the orderly universe that Newton depicted as an indication of God's power and glory. We decided that we didn't want a God who stayed up late at night tinkering with the equipment. This would not be uh, uh, the, the kind of universe that reflected God's glory and grandeur. God's glory consists in having shaped a universe that runs according to its own rules. And the discovery of those rules itself takes on the character of a religious quest. To know God, now we don't go searching authorities and ancient text, we search for the order that God has built into the universe. Alexander Pope, the great poet of the 18th century, lived a little after Newton's time, wrote a poem in praise of Newton which ended with these words, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. We actually, on the, on the SMU campus, have a kind of homage to this way of thinking in Georgian architecture, which, uh, you know, the SMU campus is rigorously maintained in the standards of, of Georgian architecture. And if you, if you know anything about Georgian architecture, you know it's built around the idea of perfect symmetry, a mathematically generated order if you've been to London and been in St. Paul's Cathedral, Christopher Wren's great piece of architecture, again, everything in perfect mathematical order, uh, bringing in the, the surrounding landscape as well as the physical characteristics of the building. So that by the early 1700s, the controversy between religion and science that began with the question of does the earth move around the sun had been solved by the idea of a world in which when we went looking to know things by observation and developing mathematical models to explain our observations, we were discovering the laws by which God had created the orderly universe in which we live. And by the way, we can build that order too in our cathedrals and our campuses and so forth and so on. God creates the order which has its own beauty and we can recreate it in our own works. So now there's a whole new theological, moral, and aesthetic system that works in this way of understanding how God works. We call this natural theology. Theology developed, again, not by attending to the Bible and ancient authorities, but by the observation of the order of the universe. By the beginning of 19th century, of the 19th century, at least in Europe and North America, this was an idea of religion that accepted the Newtonian universe that works like clockwork according to God's design, and it made that universe a part of its faith. William Paley, uh, 
in 1805 wrote a book called Natural Theology, in which he makes this famous argument for the existence of God. He says, if I am out walking on a heath, as one does in England sometimes, if I'm out walking on a heath and come upon a watch, I know that somewhere there is a watchmaker because the watch is perfectly ordered for purposes of telling time. It didn't just exist there by nature. If, so if, I, if I'm out walking on a heath and I come upon a watch, I know that there's a watchmaker. And if, he says by implication, I look around me and see this enormously ordered universe, I know that there is a God, uh, and, and the order that I can see in the universe helps me answer questions about the meaning of life. Paley is profoundly convinced that this mathematically perfect order not only sustains itself in motion, but everything in it works for the good of human beings. He even has interesting arguments on how, you, how poisonous snakes are actually a good thing, right? Because if you are going to be eaten by a snake, you would actually prefer to be poisoned by it first, right? As opposed to being swallowed whole. I don't know what he does about the boa constrictor. But this was enormously popular, this idea that we can explain the universe as an orderly place that reflects God's purposes. Every educated person in the 19th century in Britain and America studied Paley's natural theology. So did Charles Darwin. But it's important to note that it marks a rather complete dependence of Christian theology on Newtonian science, right? We solve the problem of the earlier conflict between religion and science by creating a natural theology that made Christian faith dependent on the scientific model. So Darwin, without intending it, creates a great problem by calling that, that idea of the watchmaker into question. Right? Because what's the theory of evolution except the idea that over millennia, indeed over millions of years, that perfectly ordered thing that you stumble on when you're out there walking, in fact, is just the product of random variations, not the product of a maker who had a design in mind. Darwin's discoveries about variations in animal species and his theories about their origin thus raise troubling questions for the understanding of religion. And that's one reason why it took Darwin so long to, to publish them. It called into question the existence of God. It's no, uh, accident that Thomas Huxley, Darwin's friend and popularizer, also invented the term agnostic. Not atheist, they'd always been atheist, but a an agnostic is somebody who says you can't get enough evidence to answer the question of whether there is a God. So the encounter of a religion based on natural theology with a science based on Darwin's idea of natural selection produced a general sense of conflict that seemed once again to require people to choose between scientific and religious ways of knowing. But notice that we were set up to have that conflict by the way that the theologians had adopted the scientific, the, the model of Newtonian science as a way of understanding how God works. So in 
biology in the 19th century with Darwin and in physics in the 20th century with Einstein, science left that Newtonian universe behind and never looked back. But they left the theologians there holding on to that Newtonian model for dear life because they had decided that's how God works. Now notice the parallel. The theologians hanging on to the Newtonian model because they think that's how God works. Not very different from the people back in Galileo's time holding on to that geocentric model because they're convinced that's how God works. Maybe what we need is a little more flexibility in our understanding of how God works. But of course, what did happen in the 20th century, especially in America, was the emergence of a kind of biblical literalism that instead of examining the tension between science and religion, decided that we could use the Bible as a source of evidence that would be as good as the evidence that we get from scientific experimentation. The Bible as a source of revealed knowledge is the only certain way of knowing, says the biblical literalist. And any way of knowing that conflicts with the Bible is wrong and has to be corrected in light of what we know about biblical revelation. That's not unlike scientific materialism that says any way of, of uh, knowing the world that isn't justified by experimental science is wrong and has to be corrected by experimental science. So we get, we get science and religion uh, each producing their own dogmatism to uh, oppose one another. An extreme example, I suppose, would, would be what uh, the historian of science, Owen Gingrich, talks about uh, as the miraculous sea of brass. In the Old Testament, in the story of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, there is a, a vast, uh, brass basin that is in the temple. No one's quite sure what it was used for, but uh, the, in, in both Kings and Chronicles, the Old Testament tells us, and it's quite explicit about this, that the miraculous sea of brass is 10 cubits across and 30 cubits around cubits about 17 inches, so it's big, right? 10 cubits across, 30 cubits around. What's wrong with that? Pi r squared, exactly. It has to be 31.46 cubits around. <laughs> Nobody knew that at the time that the Old Testament was, uh, was written, of course. But that the, Owen Gingrich, the historian of science, uses that as a, as a way of pointing out that you, you can't get observational data out of the biblical text. But biblical literalism seems to be built on the idea that we, we, we have to treat the Bible as a source of scientific evidence, and we still understand the world in scientific terms, we just go to the Bible to get our evidence. I don't know that anybody has ever held that the sea of brass was miraculous because it violated uh, uh, the laws of ge geometry, but we do have people who seriously argue that the earth is only six to 10,000 years old because of the chronology that they find in the Bible. Anything that argues against that has to be wrong and we've got to argue with the evidence until uh, we uh, vindicate the Bible. Biblical literalism uses the Bible as an authority in the same way that science uses mathematics and observation as an authority. And those two ways of knowing are never going to meet. <laughs>
But that's quite a different way of using the Bible than theologians used it in the pre-modern era. What those theologians were doing when they argued about biblical authority was not setting up the Bible as an authority to defeat all others, but rather their point was to bring all of our sources of knowledge into relationship with one another, including bringing our knowledge of how the world is put together physically, together with our knowledge of what makes sense of our lives morally, incorporating into what we know some things that modern science has deliberately decided to tr not to try to tell us. The modern successor of that ancient theological way of knowing is not biblical literalism, but a kind of philosophy that uh, John Polkinghorne, the uh, theologian and physicist, calls critical realism. All of our ways of knowing, Polkinghorne suggests, connect us to a reality that exists independently of our minds and our theories. That's what science and theology have in common. As our theories get better, whether they're theological theories or scientific ones, they show us the reality more accurately, but none of them completely represents reality. They don't give us all of it, and they don't give it to us with 100% accuracy. So what we are constantly trying to do, Polkinghorne says, is to bring our different ways of knowing together without ever insisting that we've integrated them completely. See, we make those mistakes historically when we conclude that we've integrated them completely. Then you get Newtonian physics and you tie theology to science at a certain period in time. We have to allow each way of knowing to tell us what it can without any, allowing any of them to claim to be the only way of knowing. And that allows, says Polkinghorne, for a genuine dialogue between science and religion. At the beginning of the 21st century, it seems to me that that is a more promising way to deal with the relationship between science and religion than the conflict that has marked the relationship since the beginning of the 20th century. And it is a more appropriately modest claim about the relations between science and religion than the complete integration that marked the natural theology of the 18th and 19th centuries. So the lesson I take from all of this is not that we should abandon science or religion, but that we should maintain an appropriate distance between them so that they can enter into a genuine dialogue from which working truths might emerge. And the solutions that aim for a complete integration of science and religion or a complete separation are, uh, are, are both mistaken and have both given us problems in the past. What we're looking for is that kind of critical realism that allows us to have a genuine dialogue. And with that, we should perhaps have a dialogue, and I should stop talking and let you ask some questions. Thank you.